Can you hear me? Great. Okay, thanks very much for, uh, for coming, guys. Uh, just to introduce uh, myself, uh, I'm James Norman. Uh, I'm the engineering manager at Storage Made Easy, um, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, I've been at Storage Made Easy for, uh, for, for coming up to three years now, and uh, I run the engineering team here. And before that, I worked at uh, Sony PlayStation, where I was a, uh, a developer there um, on, on many of their platforms. So in this, uh, in this uh, brief talk today, uh, I'm going to go through how we can optimize our object storage uh, to make, make it you know, the best that it can be uh, for, for media entertainment uh, use cases. A lot of the things we'll cover today you know, might be around media entertainment, but the uh, applicability is, is also across other fields like uh, medical and genomics, and also in general, just big data as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, you know, some of the challenges, you know, what, what firms are facing these days with their storage, uh, and how we can start to optimize our object storage and what tools we can use to, to, to make best use of our object storage. So um, the current situation today uh, is that we have a growing number of data feeds coming in uh, to our storage systems. Uh, you know, whether we're using you know, object storage or file storage or cloud storage, we have more and more multimedia streams coming in. So whether that's streams from uh, TV broadcast shows you know, in 4K, 8K, uh, Ultra HD, whether that's feeds, you know, raw feeds from cameras um, that are filming the content, for example, uh, or whether that's uh, gaming consoles and, and esports, the, 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 the media that that's generating, through to surveillance, uh, through to surveillance uh, virtual reality, and of course mobile phones, we're generating more and more data feeds these days, and you know we're we're getting not, not only more data feeds but also an increased volume uh, that's coming through that that pipe as well. So just to give an example uh, of the sort of uh, scale of, of you know, uh, data that we're talking about. If we're looking at a, a situation of a, you know, a, a chat show uh, that, that might be on the TV uh, on the weekend, we might expect them to be filming uh, in ultra, ultra HD, uh, typically 8-bit RGB at about 24 frames per second. Raw UHD footage like that would generate about 33 gigabytes worth of uh, data per minute. Now, if we multiply that up by an hour-long episode, we're starting to talk about you know, nearly one and a half terabytes worth of uh, single stream footage uh, for that episode. And of course, a single stream is not um, you know, really what we're recording on a chat show these days. You know, there's five, six, seven, eight cameras uh, recording a particular episode. Uh, so you know, we're, we're talking in excess of 10 terabytes worth of data, perhaps, for a particular you know, uh, one hour long episode of a, of a chat show. That doesn't even take into account the, the extra data that we're generating on top of that. For example, if we're localizing that into different uh, languages, whether we're doing uh, audio captioning on top of that, we're generating more and more data, uh, and we need storage that's capable of, uh, of managing that. Now, typically, what, what uh, people have is they might have a mixture of storage, maybe some file storage, and also maybe some, some object storage, maybe like OpenStack uh, Swift, for example. And people have different storage platforms for different reasons. You know, they might have their file or block storage because it's, uh, it's very fast for them. They can write to it very quickly. Uh, they can read from it very quickly as well. Uh, but it can't scale. Uh, it can't handle the sheer volumes of data that we need to store these days. So they're looking towards object storage. Uh, and, that, and that's very common. So why, why do they pick object storage these days? Well, object storage is perfect uh, for handling very large volumes of data. You know, it can handle terabytes, petabytes, exabytes worth of data. And it can scale, uh, you know, pretty much endlessly uh, and eliminate hotspots that you might see on, on typical file storage. It's also perfect uh, for unstructured data. You know, for example, in the media space, there's an awful lot of unstructured data there. And, you know, it's very performant. Uh, and a lot of the, the object storage platforms provide tools and, uh, and techniques for for you know, moving this large amount of data up and down between, between the storage platforms like DLOs, uh, multi-part uploads, range reads, for example. There's also other benefits for object storage, like you know, cost savings, uh, built-in DR, and geo deployment as well. But these firms that want to, to use the object storage for, for all of this uh, data, um, you know, what, what sort of requirements do they have? 
Well, they need storage that uh, needs to scale uh, and always be available. Well, you know, OpenStack Swift can do that, for example. Ceph can help you with that. So that, that's pretty much a good, a good tick box on that one. We need to be able to pull data down uh, and push it up in the quickest possible way. Well, like we covered on the previous slide, things like DLOs, MPUs, range reads, for example, they're very good for, uh, for that. We need to be able to secure the data uh, and enforce the security policies because this media, all of these media assets are very important to these organizations that need to protect it. Um, there's some support, you know, for example, encryption at rest, which we can do on the, on the object storage in most cases, uh, but you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a complete feature set there. Uh, there's also a need to access um, you know, and share this data inside and outside of the organization. Again, you know, the object storage, we can't really share it with people outside of the company without giving them access keys and secret keys and, and opening up the firewall ports to the storage. And of course, we need access in the, in the crucial workflows through our DAMs, MAMs, uh, or if we look in sort of the research and genomic areas, you know, through the genome labs and research institutes. And finally, you know, we need ease of use as well. You know, this needs to be used by end users and adopted by end users. And that's not something that's particularly easy with object storage uh, you know, when we're dealing with users who perhaps aren't tech savvy. So uh, Storage Made Easy, uh, we're a UK company and we produce a, a product called the Enterprise File Fabric. Now the File Fabric uh, at its core is a, is a virtual application that can be deployed into you know, any virtualization platform like OpenStack, for example. And uh, at its core, it provides connectors to 60 different storage backends. You know, so it can talk to things like OpenStack, it can talk to Ceph, uh, it can talk to Amazon S3, it can talk to Google, Dropbox, you know, whatever you have, it can pretty much talk to it. We were able to provide you know, this vast amount of connectors to lots of different storage types, and that gives you a single pane of glass view into the storage. So you can see you know, your Amazon storage next to your, your local file storage next to your, your Swift storage, for example. And on top of that, we're able to offer a lot of features to, to the users there. So for example, there's lots of benefits for the organization, such as being able to you know, secure the data, track it, audit it, uh, you know, trace uh, where users are and what they're doing on the system, for example, apply policies like encryption at rest on the storage. And for the users of the organization, it gives them you know, primarily access, ease of access to the storage. You know, we provide access through you know, web, desktops, uh, mobiles, uh, you know, a range of different platforms they can access the storage through. It also gives them a very nice set of collaboration tools so they can work together. So if you have different editors, they can share files with one another, uh, collaborate on different files with one another. And there's also productivity tools in there to help them uh, be more productive in their roles as well. There's a lot that this uh, particular diagram explains, but there's also you know, things like uh, protocol gateways. So we provide web DAV interfaces, FTP, SFTP interfaces, uh, you know, desktop applications, mobile applications, uh, and, and of course, at its very core, cool, we have a RESTful API um, you know, that they can connect through. So um, you know, why is the file fabric great for, for these particular use cases? Well, you know, firstly, it's integrated into every point of access. You know, so it can go into the web. There's no plugins required. There's a simple web file manager. Desktops, you know, it can integrate directly into uh, you know, your Windows file share. So you can see it as a network share on your PC. There's dedicated applications, as we talked about, on iOS and Android. Legacy protocol gateways uh, supporting FTP, SFTP, and WebDAV. So if you have, you know, in your genomics lab a, a, uh, uh, a microscope, you know, it can talk to the FTP server. And this, you know, this all means that it integrates into your toolset. Just an example here, you know, we have, uh, if you can see it, you know, this is a Windows desktop connected to a range of different storage platforms. In our case, uh, you know, we're interested in the Swift storage, for example. This is object storage, but we can drill into it as files and folders, open up particular folders, uh, double click on files and you know, instantly see, see videos and download content from the object storage. Uh, it's very end user friendly and that's the key here. There's also no more command line access required as well. Um, you know, people who are using object storage are probably very familiar uh, with command line, but if you wanna grow the object storage out to the rest of the organization, they can't use the command line. So one of the really neat things about the file fabric itself is it provides the, you know, as I touched on, the, the, the end user view into the storage, gives them very easy ways to access the storage. You can do away with the command line and you can also get a lot more benefits by moving to the file fabric. Data movement is also really important, uh, you know, for, for people who are dealing with uh, large data sets in particular. 
Um, let's say, for example, you're working with uh, you know, your colleague who's in a different country and you have a very large, uh, maybe a movie file or a, or a genome uh, piece of data and they need it there on their systems by the morning. With the file fabric, you can simply do a drag and drop movement of that data from one system to the other and it can be there, you can walk away, leave it, you don't have to monitor it and you know, when, the, when the user wakes up the next morning, they can access the files. So that uses our, our M-Stream technology uh, that we've been developing on for, for, for quite a while now. Uh, but it doesn't use anything, uh, anything proprietary. Uh, you know, it uses a lot of the underlying technology provided by the storage platforms like DLOs, MPUs, range reads, uh, to parallelize the uploads and the downloads and the transfers of these files between the different locations. Uh, so there's, there's little or no vendor lock in there. And what it helps accelerate is things like you know, cross-cloud transfers, uh, transfers from the end user, uh, from your desktop up to the storage, and also likewise from the storage back down to your desktop as well. So just an example, you know, here we have a, a very quick example of the drag and drop, which you can perform from your desktop up to your object storage. So here I'm dragging from my, from my local Mac into my Swift storage. No browser plugins, uh, nothing proprietary there, just works in any web browser. And this is now doing you know, multi-streamed upload from the, from the web browser and also multi-part uploads to the storage on the back end. So it goes pretty fast and it pretty much minimizes the effect of latency across the network there. Um, and you know, when this is going on between two different servers, it's pretty much using the, the full data pipe that, uh, that is available between the, between the two storage locations. There's also uh, the cross-cloud transfer as well. You know, so for example, if uh, you have a, uh, some, some you know, camera footage perhaps from a, from a chat show episode, you wanna take it into the editing suite, maybe they have the file systems in the editing suite, Again, it's a very simple drag and drop uh, between the two platforms. Here we have our Swift storage. What we're going to do is we're going to drag a 10 gigabyte file from one to the other. We're going to drag it over to our file system. And now that transfer will just kick off in the background. The user can close the browser, walk away, and be assured that when they come back, they'll see the, um, they'll see the file in the directory. So you can see that you know, in this case, it's using um, you know, 100 megabytes per second uh, data transfer there which is pretty much the, the upper limit of the, of the pipe between the two storage systems. Object previews as well are pretty important for customers. Uh, you know, when dealing with large files, um, they don't want to have to download the whole file or the whole object in order to see uh, whether it's the one that they're looking for. So the file fabric itself provides previews for, for lots of different file types. Some of those are particularly handy, for example, media files. You know, media files can be very large, terabytes in size. So with a file fabric, they can simply initiate previews of those files um, so they can start to you know, stream those files without needing to download you know, a one terabyte size file to see what's actually in it. Again, this is applicable for other use cases as well, for example, around DICOMs and, and genome um, files as well. And of course, there's some generic viewers in there as well for things like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and many of the end user friendly uh, uh, tools that people are using. So just an example, again, here we're dealing with you know, 150, 150 megabyte uh, MP4. We can just open it up, have a look at the preview, uh, click the preview, no need to download the full file, it's starting to stream straight from the object storage, uh, and then we can start to scrub through the video uh, to see different points um, you know, uh, and see whether this is the actual video file that we're looking for. Content distribution is also really important uh, for a lot of uh, organizations. Uh, when you're sharing data with people outside of the company, uh, quite often there's some shadow IT going on. Uh, they want to, uh, maybe they're using some insecure FTP servers to, to transfer files to other parties, uh, or maybe they're using drop, unsecured Dropbox accounts, or whatever they're using. Uh, there's often some insecurity there in terms of how they're transferring the data from one to the other. It's also a case of replication from one storage system to the other. However, with the file fabric, what they can do is they can replace those maybe the existing FTP servers and replace those with you know, the file fabric secure sharing capabilities uh, where everything is logged. So you know, as soon as someone accesses that, that, that shared link, you know, it's all logged. They can do both inbound, so they can receive files and outbound sharing. And they can also individually protect files, put time-based expiries on files, uh, and get real-time reporting of access as well. So just a quick example here. You know, again, we have, our, we have our Big Buck Bunny movie. What we can do is we can go and um, start to share this file by URL, 
We can set expirations on it, limits on downloads, and, and also passwords. What we can then do is we can then send this across to our colleagues uh, by email if we want, or we can send them the link, or we can send it via SMS if we want to. And then, so we, in this case, we generate the shared link. And then on the next slide, what we'll do is we'll, we'll pretend that we are the user receiving the link, and now accessing the link, they need to enter the password. Again, if they, if they access this after three days, then the file would no longer be available. And then they can now start to download the file. So now they've achieved the secure distribution of files, and there's also no need to replicate that file onto lots of different storage platforms as well. It's also storage agnostic as well. Um, so you know, because we support a very broad range of, uh, of clouds, you know, it doesn't really matter what we're talking to. We can provide all of this functionality for all the different clouds. Um, and also, the file fabric doesn't write in any proprietary formats. You know, so if you're using Swift or Ceph, for example, or whatever your storage system is, you can still continue to access the storage directly, as well as using the storage through the file fabric as well. Uh, you know, we don't write in any proprietary formats. We use all of the underlying technology, like I said before, um, uh, around that. There's also some built-in intelligence into the platform as well, uh, you know, where so the product can integrate into platforms like uh, Google Vision, Amazon Media Services, and Elemental uh, to, to give you things like automatic tagging and classifications, uh, automatic transcriptions, and all of this is searchable uh, at your fingertips as well. So just to, just to recap again on where we were, um, you know, what do the big firms need? You know, some of the key points are sharing the data. You know, we can now do that. We don't have to duplicate the data off. Um, we can now set policies. You know, we can use storage encryption and also enforce policies through the file fabric. We can also integrate this into our workflows you know, through our Windows tools, for example, if we wanted to do it through those platforms. And of course, the key one, ease of use for end users as well. We can see how easy that is to interact with the storage uh, for, for, you know, for all the different platforms that we support. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, but we're also over uh, on stand C17, which is just on the uh, the back corner of this room.